media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Oh, it's great to talk with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yourself? Okay. I've uh, been some interesting uh, two weeks since we last spoke in the market, that's for sure. We saw the Dow dump 700 points last Friday, then bounce back up, and, and gold's been, gold and silver have been really rocking uh, the past couple days. So that means you're busy and you can't really take the summer off. <laughs> well, we all got to find some way to do it every once in a while. But uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting time of getting more like emails and questions uh, about what's going on uh, because... I think uh, in a lot of ways people are feeling confused because the market is making big moves up and down, it seems, on any given day. And then the news itself uh, is contradictory in, in a certain sense. Um, in the United States, there's so much focus now in the U.S. media on what Donald Trump is tweeting or saying, um, and that's what captures people's minds and it's very difficult to make sense out of it if you if you're going by that because uh if you take the trade issue uh he talked about increasing tariffs last friday and the market dumped and then over the weekend uh he, he kind of walked that back a little bit then he didn't walk it back and then on monday uh he said that uh that china wants to negotiate and then uh, the Chinese uh, government made a statement saying they didn't contact the United States, uh, but the market went up. And so, so people are, I think, seeing all these headlines and, and action and, and trying to make sense of it all and, and having a very difficult time doing it. When you have a market that appears to be news-driven instead of technically driven, does that make it harder for traders to make sense of it all? No, because I, I actually think it's it's almost the opposite. Um, for example, uh, it is difficult in a certain sense. Uh, it, it really depends on what time frame you're looking at. So, yeah, it is very confusing and difficult if you're trying to figure out what's going on based on one day's action. Uh, it, it's certainly difficult, uh, and, sh- and that can shake you out. Uh, it, no matter how you're positioned. Uh, so I think the thing for everyone to do is kind of take a step back and look at the bigger trends of the market and try to fit these day-to-day gyrations into that. So if you look at uh, the U.S. stock market, for example, uh, it's almost exactly where it was 12 months ago and 90 days ago. So in a certain sense, nothing is really happening <laughs> And we're just having these moves up and down, but the volatility is higher. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more days in which the market is up or down over percent than we did two years ago. In, in 2017, there are only four days in which the Dow is up or down over a percent. And now, you know, we seem to have a day like that every single week. So that's the real thing going on is there is an increase in volatility. But that's happening within the context of a market that really hasn't, you know, moved overall. You know, it fell 20% last year and then rallied back up. So it's about the same spot it was. And if you just look at that sort of behavior and look back historically, that's the type of behavior, volatility picking up and so forth, that happens either when a market is making a very huge top uh, that will lead to a bear market, which is what, for example, gold did uh, in the year 2012, 
uh, or is a market that has run up a lot and is now going to consolidate before it has another big move. Uh, but either way, uh, there's no real short term, short term, I think, great upside in the sense that I don't think anyone should expect the U.S. stock market to make a new high and just go up, up, and up from there anytime soon. So the risks are big, uh, and, and I think that's why the volatility is increasing. So I think if you just accept that fact and ignore the noise, you're, you're more likely to have a, a better handle on, on what's going on. And the same thing uh, goes, goes on with, with gold. Um, gold and silver have had a tremendous uh, rally uh, since July uh, when gold broke through 1350. Uh, and now it's gone up to 1550 and silver, as we're speaking today, is over eighteen dollars, and that's a high for silver uh, not seen uh, since uh, two uh, a year and a half now. The last time silver has been this high was in January, uh, late January twenty eighteen. Uh, so people, I see a lot of people like saying, "Oh, gold's at fifteen fifty, and we expect a big drop, and then the market doesn't drop enough." Is they're predicting, and, and so I think there's also confusion in the gold market of people seeing this run up and being skeptical or scared of it, thinking there's going to be another decline, and then this decline doesn't seem to, to, to take place. And that's the type of market environment that takes place when a market uh, <laughs> begins a new bull market. And I think that's what gold and silver did, uh, because gold, when it went through 1350, it went through a resistance level going back over four years. Uh, and I, and when, some, when a move like that happens, I think it's very significant. And you're basically coming out of a long base. Uh, and when that happens, the market will tend to go up uh, for six to 12 months with hardly any pullback at all. Uh, and we've seen that type of action in the U.S. stock market. Uh, it did that in 2017. Uh, it did it in 2013 and 2014, uh, and and that's where I think you gotta to get back to what I was saying earlier. People and I think need to step back from what's happening on a daily basis and trying to figure out, you know, what the implication of this or that tweet makes, which uh, or statement from the president, when in reality uh, they're contradictory. Uh, and I think, you know, the best case out of that is to say he's purposely trying to confuse people and it's part of his negotiation skills and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, that's the best case out of it. But either way, I, I think it's not meant to, uh, be absolutely clear, not something anyone should base their decisions on. And, and, and therefore, again, step back, look at the trends of these various markets that you're participating in you know, for three or four years and not just what's happening today. Uh, so that's kind of the message I really think is the most useful uh, for, for people uh, now in these markets. We'll have more with Mike Swanson right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mike Swanson. Mike, U.S. consumer confidence is the highest it's been since 2000 when we had the dot-com crash. Is it a warning sign or a good sign for the economy when people are feeling good about their shopping? Well, I, I think there's 
lots of warning signs, uh, you know, mixed with your, uh, consumer confidence stat is a, is a stats that show that consumers now have more debt on their credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> than they had since then too, which I think is, is, a, is a dangerous sign. But, uh, you know, this month we've seen the yield curve invert and this morning as we're speaking, it, it's inverted even more than it's been, uh, in previous days. And this is some, this is something that, uh, we're speaking of the yield curve and I'm speaking of the, uh, two year bond and the 10 year bond. The, the rates on, on two year uh, bonds are now uh, higher than 10-year bonds, treasury bonds, and this is the most accurate indicator of a recession occurring 6 to 12 months out in the future. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a huge warning sign. Now, the argument, though, against uh, this being a problem is that uh, one of the uh, Trump uh, officials, um, Larry Kudlow, two weeks ago, uh, said that Okay, the yield curve is inverted, but this is a symptom not of weakness in the United States, but that uh, bond markets all over the world have interest rates so low and dropping that money's coming into the U.S. and distorting our bond market, and, and therefore this is simply an anomaly. Uh, however, I, I would say to not to just grasp on that statement uh, and just uh, you know say everything's great because uh, the same thing was also said in 2006 by the head of the Treasury Department at that time too and even Ben Bernanke of the Federal Reserve because the yield curve inverted back then and they said basically it doesn't mean anything. So every time it every time it has inverted, it has meant something. Uh, so, you know, here we are. I, I, hopefully these people are, you know, hopefully Cudlow's right, but I'm not going to... Um, <laughs> based my investment decisions on hope that this time is different. Uh, so I think what people should do is, again, watch the action of the stock market um, and look at the indicators, and not just daily action, but, uh, for example, um, two indicators right now I think are very useful is the 50-day moving average on the S&P 500 and the 200-day moving average. When you use these indicators, you're not looking at, they don't move, you know, by hourly action or they're not going to make a signal because the market's up or down on a given day because they're an average over time of the prices. And right now, the 50-day moving average is acting as price resistance. Uh, it's at 2950 uh, on the S&P 500. So if we can get back above it, then that would be more positive for the stock market. And maybe then there's a chance, a greater chance that Cudlow and other people like him are correct. However, uh, support is at 2800 and we're close to that too. So we're in a funny situation where the market took a hit, um, it, you know, off the highs, uh, bounced, and now we're sandwiched between these two technical levels. And I think... Uh, you know, the next meaningful move is going to be dictated by whether we go, you know, through the support or up through resistance, and then we'll have to take it from there. So if we go below 2800 uh, you can expect lower prices, and um, and then we'll have to figure out where we're headed uh, after that. So, you know, and also as far as economic data, there's another risky Warning sign, I think, is this morning it came out that in the United States, home prices uh, had the smallest gain uh, since 2012 in a given month. Uh, so that also is a sign that things are cooling down. And that's happening with interest rates having gone down and mortgage rates having gone down in the past month. Uh, you would think that would stimulate uh, you know people to buy homes, but so far... It has not. Um, and again, and then I always got to scratch my head and wonder, you know, if the economy is so great, uh, why is the Fed having to lower interest rates? Why is the Fed fund futures market projecting um, at least two more rate cuts before the end of the year? To me, uh, those are signs of growing risk. Uh, and I think it's best for people to be cautious in the stock market and rebalance their portfolios. If, if they're in, you know, if they're so heavily weighted in stocks, it's making up 
more uh, in their accounts than it than than you know it should. Uh, they should reduce it. Talk to their investment advisor uh, and so forth. Personally, uh, I think uh, a key to navigating the market now is having a percentage of anyone's account. They have to figure out how much, uh, but devoted to gold, silver, and even the mining stocks, uh, because I think they're going to benefit, and they are benefiting from the Fed so far lowering interest rates. It's gold that's doing better than the stock market this year. We're speaking today in silver as a, you know, is, is over $18, uh, while the stock market is down 5% from its recent high and isn't even up. Uh, in, in the past 12 months, uh, whereas this year, something like the GDX gold stock ETF is up, uh, 37%. And many, there's many mining stocks up even more than that. And even now, the small cap mining stocks are very starting to break out of, uh, various, um, you know, resistance zones. They tend to lag the big caps. Uh, but now that I think, you know, gold, uh, at 1500 or above is a high enough price and silver at 18 for sure with the silver mining stocks to make, uh, the fundamentals of the smaller mining stocks, uh, more viable and therefore they're starting to attract more money. So I think there's an exciting, they're the exciting spot right now to make money in time. You know, I, I, I plan on buying other sectors <laughs> once we see more of a pullback in the stock market, but for now, and probably to the end of the year, uh, the mining world, I think, is, is really maybe the only place that makes sense uh, for, for, you know, putting in new buys in on the long side. We'll have more with Mike Swanson right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mike Swanson. Mike, is crude in one of those places where the end of the driving season is going to be a big factor? Yeah, uh, historically, uh, crude oil actually does peak out in July and decline into December, January. And if you look at the chart, it's so far doing exactly that. Uh, it did make a peak in July, and we're below those levels. And, um, you know, with the possibility, too, of, of some economic slowdown in the economy next year, uh, commodities besides gold and silver as a whole are trending down. Uh, the agriculture commodities are trending down. Some of the other metals are even trending down, so it wouldn't shock me if we don't see oil also trend down in the end of the year. But seasonally, it does that anyway uh, as the driving season uh, peters out. So maybe you know it might be time to plan out what kind of which oil stocks you might want to buy um, in December or January. Is there any hap- anything happening with the marijuana space? Well, the some the big cap uh marijuana stocks this is Aurora of uh, Aurora cannabis uh and cannabis growth uh they've been fading uh since may uh you know <laughs> especially cannabis growth a lot of them they just had uh bad news with their earnings uh many of them especially cannabis growth uh bought up lots of other smaller companies and to to grow and combine themselves took on a lot of debt and that's spooking uh, investors, but some of the smaller ones are still hanging in there, and it's my hope, you know, that once, you know, if we get a pullback in the U.S. stock market uh, for a few weeks and, 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 and bottom out, that we should see a return uh, to of some money into these marijuana stocks. But right now, the big cap ones are, are, are you know, underperforming even the U.S. stock market. 
Uh, Gamey growth is down 6% just today, down 50% since May. But, you know, the, some of the smaller ones are just floating around, kind of ignoring that. So, so that's a good sign for them, I would say. Is Bitcoin doing anything? Well, it, it's floating around. Uh, it got back above 10,000. And, uh, I don't really know <laughs> what it's going to do. Um, it's, or what it really is. It's not money. Uh, no companies really use it for money. It, it, it has too high of a transaction cost, uh, to, to be viable as a, as a currency. So it's really an instrument of speculation. And it popped up a, a few months ago and it's managing to hang around 10,000. But I don't know, you know, is it going to break down and, and fall through that level and just give up the ghost on this rally? If it does, if it breaks that level, uh, I would assume it will fall and fade out, uh, as some of the bigger marijuana stocks have done. Uh, if it doesn't, then we <laughs> might be wondering, is this actually something that some people are throwing their money at? Uh, when they see weakness in, in the financial markets, but historically that's not been the case um, because uh, I mean, if you do a correlation analysis, the thing that Bitcoin has historically, ever since its existence, traded most closely to is the NASDAQ 100. It's just gone up more than the NASDAQ 100 when it's gone up and down more when it's gone down. So if that relationship sticks, then I think we're going to see Bitcoin uh, drop and dump uh, and, and be substantially lower between now and the end of the year. The problem is um, it, it's it's just the historical correlations with it. It's I don't believe it's really uh, a safe haven. Uh, so and it's it, you know we we know uh, it can be manipulated very easily. Uh, people have done studies on that showing that uh, just a handful of so-called whales uh, were behind much of the manipulation two years ago that drove it up to 20,000. So it's something I'm very wary of, but I do know that lots of people love to trade it, and uh, especially on apps because it's easy to open up an account. It doesn't even take much money. Mike, you're a, a big follower of Robinhood, the trading app. Anything interesting there? Well, uh, the craziest thing about it, and, and I have a small account on it myself, just kind of just keep myself engaged with what's going on there, but the craziest thing about it is they have a part of it that ranks or shows you the 100 most owned stocks. Uh, so, for example, there's something like 200,000 people own Apple that have a Robinhood account, but the number one most widely owned stock is actually Aurora Cannabis. Uh, Apple was number one uh, a year ago, but it got displaced when the stock market took a hit uh, at the end of last year, and Aurora just moved up the rankings. But the thing that's the most fascinating to me about this is in 2016, Several of the gold stock ETFs were in the top 100, uh, especially JNUG and Nugget, the triple ETF. So there were a lot of people back then that were trading them. And then when gold pulled back at the end of that year, they, they dropped off the list. Now, what's interesting is they've not gone back on the list. So even with this recent rally, uh, or current rally, because uh, I don't believe it's over, uh, at least on Robinhood, the individual investors on there have not gotten back in. Uh, neither GDX, GLD, IAU, Nugget, JNUG, none of the gold or silver ETFs are in the top 100. None of the mining stocks are in the top 100. So this tells me that, the, you know, I think Robinhood's probably, you know, mostly American investors. So the small American investor people in the United States, they just, at so far, are completely oblivious to what's going on with the gold and silver market and, and aren't participating yet. Uh, so I think that's a reason for people to 
remain bullish and and wait. You know, it, 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 one wonders what's it going to take to get Americans to to get in, but they will get in eventually. And uh, it's like the marijuana stocks. Uh, there's a bunch of them on the list, but probably wasn't two years ago. Mike, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. Great to talk with you. My guest has been Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. If you have any questions for Mike or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.